excited to see so many new faces. I have faces that I recognize because these are my students from Principles of Sustainability. Yes, hello. Um, but I, I'm new, I'm a new lecturer in the SRM, and so there are lots of faces that I have seen live in the hallway but haven't met yet. So thank you for coming, for being here. Um, and we have these special guests. They're here today to talk about climate activism. Um, they are people from different groups doing different things in different parts of California. And so I am going to let them speak for themselves and introduce themselves. And we're going to have this room until 3 p.m. Um, if you need to leave early, feel free to do so. You all need seats. There's some seats here. Um, but um, when we open up for questions, um, I think the main idea here is that we wanted this visit to be something that initiates conversations about possible collaborations. So that's why I asked all of them to write their uh, contact information there, because if you don't get your question answered and you have to go for whatever reason, um, feel free to take a picture and then contact them later. Um, you know, hopefully what we can do, like I said, is initiate conversations that can follow up. Okay, so without further ado, I'm going to introduce you all. I'm, not, I'm just going to let you all introduce yourselves. So, I'm going to get started. Um, just your name and then the organization you work um, with right now. Um, and maybe just share a little bit about what your organization is working on right now, what's exciting, what's, you know, what's something that you, maybe you've accomplished recently or that you're working towards. So, um, my name is Grace. I am part of the Los Angeles Public Sunrise Movement. Um, and uh, yeah, right now we're working, uh, we're kind of restructuring the hub a little bit so that our organizing is more intentional with like the communities that we work with. Um, so yeah, like uh, personally, my role within Sunrise LA is the community building lead. And community is something that's like super like um, important, not only to me, but like in the climate movement because it's so devastating and like we don't have a lot of wins. So like, Building community really helps the retention rate, like people coming back, they're not feeling really burned out because they're organizing with their friends. And so it makes it a little bit more funner when we do have like those big blows, big oil. But yeah, like just knowing that like your friends are in it with you, you're not alone, and that really just keeps like it builds like more sustainable and stronger movements going forward. Hi, I'm Kayla Cruz. Uh, I'm from Youth Climate Shark LA. I'm one of the founders of the organization. I'm currently on a little hiatus. Um, but Sam can like tell you all about what we're currently doing. Uh, Sam, he, him. Uh, I'm the lead organizer for Youth Climate Strike LA. Um, what was the question? Whatever you want to share about what your organization is currently working on. Or you, you shared with us some of the recent wins. I met many of them were not here yet. So I know we, you know, they arrived early, and we had a little bit of a, you know, conversation in the beginning. But don't worry about repeating yourself. Share with share with them whatever is exciting you. Yeah. Um. So we have we had uh, quite a lot of, um, you know, we do we do prioritize like relational organizing, and so relational organizing is when you build like relationships with your community, and, and build from there. And so you know, it allowed us to create a pathway where you know, for a long time we were just like considered a bunch of silly kids that. You know, we have climate strikes, but like they don't really do anything. Uh, and so I really I recognized that was an issue in around 2019 because you know, the pandemic hit. And so you know, we were turning a lot of our, you know, our other years in our head, like you know, how do we make climate organizing like relevant and you know, popular again? Uh, and so you know, one thing we decided to do was step into electoral politics because last year was an electoral year. Um, and so we ran. The, the, this divestment bill called SB 1173, which is the fossil fuel divestment bill, and because the bill was written by youth and pushed by youth, we got it farther than it's ever been in 10 years. And so it was a huge organizing win for us, and it just really put in perspective like the power of youth organizing, the influence that we can have, that we can do things that literally adults that are they get paid to do this couldn't do. Like it was it was pretty game changing uh, for me. And then uh, also like more locally in Los Angeles. Uh, uh, I noticed like none of the mayoral candidates had a climate platform. And I don't know if you guys live in LA or like following LA politics, but you remember Karen Bass and Rick Caruso were leading, and um, 
It took me disrupting Kara Bass's Meryl debates and getting dragged out by security in order for her to make a platform. Which, mind you, I, I emailed her and asked her, I was like, why don't you have a climate action? Like, why are you talking about the climate crisis? This is the most impending issue, especially for young voters. Like, what are you doing? She ignored me, so I disrupted it, and then she made one like a month later. So, it's a power of organizing. Um, hi guys, my name is Shekinah, uh, pronouns she, hers. I work at Filipino Workers Center. I've been a community organizer for a while and I do a lot of um, immigration and labor organizing. Um, and my primary thing is anti-trafficking work. Uh, but the reason I'm here is because the primary causes and effects of all of those issues is the climate crisis. And so when it comes to anti-trafficking, a lot of people have to end up moving to the U.S. and getting paid um, basically nothing and overwork because of the floods in the Philippines or because of just different uh, climate issues throughout the world. Um, and then the same thing with labor issues. A lot of our agricultural workers, farm workers, um, people that are most likely to be affected by toxins and pollution they are black and brown folks, but they are often not included or the um, front of what is traditionally the climate justice movement, um, especially nationally. And so um, really my goal in a lot of the work I do is connecting, because a lot of these folks, they know how they're being affected by the climate, right? But they can't really think about saving the world when they're trying to put food on the table, when they're trying to survive and they're trying to take care of their kids. Um, and so my goal is to, one, like help them meet those basic needs, but two, how can we make the climate movement more accessible to these communities? Um, and how can we empower them to really be like, they already have the tools, they already know the issues, they are the front lines, and they should be at the front of the movement. So um, a lot of my work is just supporting people who are already you know, leading and Um, hi, I'm Chris. Um, I currently study at CalArts, uh, BFA 3, um, making music and sounds. Go thump. Um, I am the director of a fairly new nonprofit um, called When Black and Brown Go Green. Um, it is, I, I like to use the word radical a lot because my mentor uh, and the original founder of the organization. Um, really personify what radicalism um, is and was for me. Um, something, a couple things that we're working on that really just sums us up in a sentence is uh, we're looking to plant 2,000 trees by 2024. Um, we have a giving garden um, plan to, to where it, it's like a food forest. Um, and then we're looking to invest 2,000, I mean, not 2,000, sorry. Uh, two point fifty four million uh, dollars and to youth of color um, exclusively um, ages fourteen to twenty six thank you so much um, I want to start by acknowledging the fact that um, some of the the things some of the projects that you that you described um, which are absolutely amazing all of them um, might not be completely things that we're not familiar with right. So you mentioned your involvement with um, some policy development, specifically a bill. Can you talk a little, before we open up, can you just clarify what that means? Like you said, you, because we when you started, you were doing strikes, right? And that can, Sam, if you wanna, if you wanna take that question, that'll be great. Um, yeah. So you started with the strikes. How did you move from strikes, and maybe even start, like how did you get involved with, with the strikes first, and then how did that, Evolved into the kind of policy um, entrepreneurship that you invested in. Yeah, so I first got involved with the climate movement when I was like 10 years old. And you know, back then there was um, Earth Guardians, which is like this really prominent climate justice board, and it's run by some indigenous youth from Colorado. Uh, but really, it's a statewide work. And I don't know if you guys remember in 2015, there was a case called Juliana versus the United States which was 22 young people that sued the federal government for causing climate change. And that was like a really pivotal moment for me, like realizing, because I was talking with them back and forth and, you know, uh, 
just like trying to plug into the whole situation and it was really cool to see you know other Gen Zers suing the federal government for causing climate change and I thought that was like the most powerful shit uh, and so that was like sort of my my, my my headway into like really understanding like how youth organizing and then in 2019 uh, 2018 2019 is when climate striking like really took off uh, as a result of as a result of the right and you know LA at the time uh, there was like a couple hundred people coming to climate strikes and stuff like that. And then in September, uh, right before Greta came to the United States, we had like 20,000 people on strike in the street at one time in Los Angeles. Um, the, yes, so yeah. we had a global strike, which was in September. That one had like about 22,000 people there. 22,000, largest climate strike in LA history. And yeah. so that, it was really powerful moment. That's when I tapped in with YCCLA. And we started organizing you know, a lot of climate strikes and things like that. And then, you know, the pandemic hit. And so we couldn't go outside, we couldn't interact with each other. And we're just like, you know, like our movement can't die because it's a really pivotal moment, but no one was talking about the climate crisis. It was sort of like an afterthought, which was really frustrating for me and a lot of youth organizers. And so, you know, we're thinking, you know, how can we continue to have an impact if we can't strike from school, if we can't, you know, be out in the streets? And I know a lot of people turn to digital organizing, uh, but <laughs> we decided that was the most impactful uh, course of action and that we wanted to take a more focus on legislative side because at the end of the day, you know, the climate crisis is a legislative failure. And so, you know, we were talking to a lot of people uh, and the bill, SB 1173, came out because of a collaboration with this organization called Youth vs. Apocalypse. And it was a pretty badass name, but like they're a primarily a group of like black and brown youth in the Bay Area and they're just a really strong, powerful force and amazing organizers. And so, you know, we really hit it off and we decided to run this bill called SB 1173, which is a fossil fuel divestment bill. And the issue, like why it was ran by youth in particular was because it was targeting, um, so we have something called CalPERS and CalSTRS in California, which is the State Teachers, Cal California State Teachers Retirement Fund, and also just the General Public Workers Retirement Fund. And so their money is invested in fossil fuels, which is like reaching habit all over the world. So it goes beyond California, their dollars, like they're funding indigenous genocide in the Wet'suwet'en territories in Uganda, you name it, like their money's everywhere. And so we decided, you know, like this isn't gonna stand and, you know, we need to recreate legislation to, you know, force their money to leave the fossil fuel industry as a way to cripple the fossil fuel industry and deal a moral blow, you know, you can't teach kids and expect us to have a future and lead us into the future if you're actively destroying our future, like it's a huge fucking contradiction. And so I was really upset about that and we were really strategic in the language that we wrote in the bill, and it was just a whole process. And I learned a lot about the legislative process, you know, finding an author of the bill, finding a champion for the bill, and, and running it through all the different steps of government. And I think, you know, at the end of it, we pushed it farther than it's ever been, like I said before. And we're gonna run it again this year because I realized, like, our democratic system is very undemocratic. So there's this guy, Jim Cooper, who's like this assembly member from Sacramento. He's a cop and he's, uh, he's a sheriff now. So he turned out of his position, he's a sheriff. And so like his last act to like sort of spite us because he hated us because we're a bunch of like black and brown youth from, you know, that are on the direct side of his inaction and on the direct side of like the harm that he's causing to our communities. And so when we confronted him, he didn't like us. And he like made sure we knew all the rules and all this decorum and so, you know, we ran the bill and he killed it and it was kind of really f messed up because he's the president so he could kill it if he wanted to. But everyone else that was on the assembly like board with him, they supported us and they supported the bill passing but because he didn't like us and he didn't like the bill, he just sort of killed it. But he's out now so we're gonna run it again. But. now and not only questions but if you want to share if you want to share something that you that you're doing on campus or that you're doing outside of campus or something that you're curious about that you saw somewhere that you want them to comment um floor is yours so um who wants to start you want to start with a question or a comment it can be yeah okay we have one hand up it's me. yes where do you all see yourselves in five different years Question. <laughs> right? Um, okay, so I'm, I'm the, uh, the Intergenerational Advisory Board for When Black and Brown Go Green um, really allowed me, after me asking a bunch of, hey, I'm, I'm passionate about this, let me do this, I want to do this, 
I, I, I feel like they let me do it because I'm, I'm kind of, I'm not kind of. I'm practicing self-care, guys. So this is me practicing confidence. I'm the idea guy. Like, I, I, I was walking through MacArthur Park uh, before it flooded um, because I was talking with uh, um, I'm head of maintenance, um, what, no, I'm head of grounds, um, about a beautification project. And I had already had an advisory team on board, had already had like some, some folks that were money folk, um, already had uh, a couple uh, people that were so heavy in, in, in the world of getting volunteers from companies like LinkedIn and Disney and blah, blah, blah. Um, and the biggest thing that he said was, the park isn't pretty because we don't have the money to pay people. We don't have what? We don't have the money to pay people okay. to keep it pretty. Yeah. I, I wanted to call him out, but I was like, yeah. no, I hear my grandmother's voice in the back of my head saying, be respectful. Um, <laughs> so so I, 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 chose, I chose respectful, but I also chose idea. Mm -hmm. I knew that the people that I had to go back on the on the Zoom and tell like what we walked through and what I took notes of, okay, maybe MacArthur Park isn't the move this time. But if you have someone that probably isn't speaking through a, a sphere of operation, uh, and and like um, um, I'm I'm gonna make up a word actionability. Um, he 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 probably spoke to me through a lens of limited education or limited awareness. So for the next five years, I, I, I see myself definitely being the idea guy saying, yeah, we can definitely raise 2.54 million and put that into the hands of, a, of an 18 year old graduating like, high school. It's actually like a little over 60,000, but like imagine 100 18 year olds given a, a check for $63,000 on top of their financial aid package. Um, I, 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 and on the flip side of that, I mean, yeah, I'm a singer-songwriter, so like my band and I, we're gonna do great. Um, and, but it's like putting, putting all of this in the sauce of a hip-hop song. Because sometimes it's kind of boring Let's be real. It's, it's like we love the work. I love the work. I love the work. But man, it, it is it, it is sometimes very frustrating facing the giant of motivating somebody that climate change is real, mm -hmm. that the work is real, that yeah we can pay a fourteen year old forty dollars an hour to harvest indigenous seeds. Um, so just, just motivating people. So you mean, you mean like connecting the art that you do with the, the climate activism and the climate action work that you do? Like to motivate these, people, yes. To, as a way, and we, we, in our class we've discussed that, right? A lot of the, one of the issues that we started talking is this need for a cultural shift and how can we catalyze that cultural shift with art being one of the, so these, yeah, these students here, they work on some really cool projects that they want to share. And I, one question, I saw a hand up. I was going to say, Dr. Fairfax asked the question, I'm in her class, and we talk a lot about like science communication and like effective ways to do that. And like just the other day, we were having like a really interesting conversation about using like social media as a way to make raise science awareness. Yes. Climate change is like a as an example topic. Um, so I have a question, very relevant, obviously, what is your band name? What is your, I want to listen to the music. <laughs> um, we're so under tight wraps for a little bit longer. So like March, February, March. He's gonna sing for us now. <laughs> <laughs> we, we're, 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 we're here to talk about climate. Find more information about the band in the near future. Yeah, if, if you become a super fan of the nonprofit, <laughs> you will subsequently find the band. Okay. <laughs> okay. So the prerequisite is <laughs> the prerequisite. And I, you know, I want to share to you how I, I connected with Chris. So I am a student at UCI, and I am a climate scientist who is looking for ways to communicate science better, right? So one of the things that I did was start looking around campus to see which professors would be in the art department.
department would be open to possible collaborations. And this was during the pandemic, so you know, all these different constraints that we had to deal with. So I connected with a professor who is in the art department, mm -hmm. uh, Professor Simon Penny, and we, he became my mentor. Like this is someone who um, has had decades of experience working with several different environmental movements back in the day, yeah. you know, and um, so yeah. even though we, because of the different constraints in both of our lives, we couldn't create a project yet, that mentoring, that the fact that now we had a scientist, a climate scientist, and an art professional mm -hmm. communicating, collaborating. And so he was in some advisory board like fast yeah. forward, you know, 2022, and met Chris, and immediately he like texted me, and he's like, "You have to connect with Chris <laughs> because while he is already in a phase of his life that he cannot take on this new project, long story, what I'm trying to say is that creating these networks, reaching outside of your normal network, which yes. is scientists, and really creating those connections across campus, finding." the artists that can come and talk and um, as a scientist I can say this I have heard so many times from none never here but I've heard elsewhere scientists say oh we have to dumb it down right we have to dumb the science down so people can understand that that's absurd that's not the it's, mentality it's a great way to lose the complete people. opposite of dumbing it down it's actually making it easier to understand which means like you have to think more intuitively and you have to think okay how will someone else understand this and that like is such a hard thing to do so right yeah. and so through music right through uh through activism through organizing by having people come out here and talk about their lived experience mm -hmm. at least in my experience too as both a scientist and an activist that's how i see success yeah. like if you just in your little cohort and your little silo Exactly. I want. I have a question for Khalil. Am I saying your name? Kel. 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 Because you're super quiet. But you mentioned in passing that you were one of the founding members of this organization that is represented here by three members. Yeah. Tell us how do you start an organization? Oh. <laughs> um, <laughs> well, actually, that's like a crazy story because I took environmental science my senior year. And my teacher was just like, yeah, do you guys know your planet is dying? You guys are like useless at this point and you're not doing anything? I was like, oh, okay. You're what a great you're teacher. Wow. Yeah. And, and I love that about him. Like he was real. So he helped me like find people. And I ended up like one of my close friends now, I contacted him and I was just like, hey, um, I heard about like the strike and blah, blah, blah. And he was like, come to this meeting. And so we all got together at uh, Bernie's Cafe. If it's in, in like LA, LA. Okay. yeah, yes. And um, we got together and then we just started talking uh, and we started organizing. And it's weird because like, it's just, it was a bunch of like teenagers. I was 17 at the time, like newly 17. Yeah. Um, someone was like, I think the youngest person we had was like 12. Yeah, yeah like 12 and nine. And then it was weird, but making an organization <laughs> is not as hard as like, people think it is, um, unless you want to like make it an official organization, like a, a 501c3, C3. C4. Yeah. Um, but we didn't really do that. We just got together and then we just kept building. Uh, and so we have like different groups. We have a logistics and we have uh, finance, communications, communications um, adequacy. And so you just have to like build on what you think you know. Mm -hmm. I kind of just went in and I was like, yeah, I know what I'm doing. <laughs> I didn't. I was 17. I was applying to like colleges. I was like, I had so much anxiety that I didn't even sleep at night because I kept reading like the IPCC report. Oh, and then my teacher was like, yeah, so this is going to happen and this is going to happen. I'm like, oh, yay. Um, and it was like the worst time ever. But starting an organization isn't hard. You just have to have people that have the same, I guess, ideas as you. Mindset. Mindset, yeah. Um, it's it's pretty good. Now I'm kind of like on a break and Sim's like in charge, which I'm really happy for because he's really pushed this organization to like um, the best that it, it is right now. So thank you. Thank you, Sim. Thank you. If you all have questions, you can raise your hand and ask. I, I have a million questions to ask, but I want to give you all a chance. 
true. Like this is this is a discussion. Like pretty sure you have a billion and trillion things in going on in your brains. Okay, um the activism like this slam story there's stuff like that. Um another thing is I see different types of activism and what like, there's just one. Um some people take a very far approach. Some people are like like a strike or something like that. Um, in what way, in what sort of activism do you get the most attention? And with that, what is, you get attention, but which one has the most positive attention from it? Yeah, I mean, I think you're probably like touching on like performative activism and like cloudivist and, and things like that. Uh, I think a lot of this could be, it, it can be really harmful to our movement and relatively like detrimental. I do think um, it, it depends, you know, it depends on what's current, what the media wants to talk about, what people want to listen to, like what's happening, right? So usually we get the most attention for our climate strikes and like sometimes it's really hard to get media attention, sometimes it's really easy. And it's just really about what's current and what people care about. So like around Earth Day, my DMs are like blowing up and I've got like 16 reporters that want to talk to me. And then outside of that, if there's nothing that's like, really happening or really current, like it's an afterthought. And so I think, you know, it's about maintaining consistency and sometimes it's about pushing the needle about what you think is going to get the attention that you need, but don't push it too far that you're going to alienate people or turn people off. And I feel like we've done a really bad job of that in the climate movement. We've sort of gone the route the perspective when I compare the climate movement to like the civil rights movement, things like that. Like we really go really hard on the doom and gloom and it paralyzes people. It doesn't inspire people to motivate, it doesn't inspire them to be a climate activist, it doesn't inspire them to get out and do shit. They just want to dwell in their bed and be depressed, which is like valid. But like, also, <laughs> you know, we, we need to not do that. And so, um, part of like what I'm doing now is like, I finally sort of got the reins in my head, and, in my hands, and I'm like leading this really big coalition called the California Green New Deal Coalition. And the California Green New Deal Coalition. And this is, so basically, I've been organizing for like 10 years and I haven't been getting paid because no one wants to pay me because I'm like some Gen Z organizer. <laughs> but you know, I think I really did prove myself and I put a lot of effort into to proving that I'm a capable organizer and I can communicate really well, I can talk to people. And so I got these the reins in my hands of this really big coalition of like these really big social justice and EJ movements. And you know, that's what we're thinking about. It's like, you know, how do we communicate our activism in a way that, you know, brings attention and it brings people in and it doesn't like push people out. And so, you know, it's not an easy line to walk for sure, but like, you know, you, you just do what you feel like is, is right. And you know, keep it in mind that we're about bringing people in and not pushing people out. Right. Yeah. I could probably touch on that too. Um, although, like, at, at our founding core, uh, Fay Love, Love was a, a protester. Um, before she was an organizer, if that makes sense. Um, how how she mentored me um, and how uh, the team and I were, were taking the black and brown go green is instead of, instead of leading protests, we're deciding to go extremely um, precise. So, um, we have a public wellness department. Uh, this public wellness is inspired by tribal circles and how tribal circles would come together to talk politics, trade, um, the health of the village, um, the needs of the village, the concerns of the village, um, who needs the most uh, a, a TLC, who needs the less TLC, um, where should we go when um, um, uh, seasons change and, and the ground can no longer give us, for, uh, for example, the corn that we need, or, or if there's a, a, a nutrition uh, deficiency in the soil, I, I'm being over a lot. Um, the, <laughs> but the process is important, right? Yes. So we're going directly to communities of black and brown, um, heat islands, food deserts, um, food insecurities. And, and saying, this is the mission. What are your concerns within our mission, within our bandwidth? And help us lead a conversation towards creative solutions. So not 
not just protest, protesting, not just getting any attention, but getting focused attention on yes. the community that was living. Yes, yes, yes. And since you touched on process, I want to ask Grace, because Grace is, I think, the only representative here that is in a chapter of an organization that is attached to the university, right? So you, you're, no, no? So you, you're not with the U, UCSB chapter? No, I'm in the Los Angeles. Angeles. Oh, in the Los Angeles chapter, okay. So, but Sunrise has chapters in university, and I guess that's what I'm trying to get to. So while um, Youth Climate Strike LA and when uh, Brown when, when black, black and brown, brown, green. black and brown, full green. It's a mouth. Yeah, oh, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's a catch. It wants you to Thank you. Yeah, that is awesome. Eat a tune for that. Right. <laughs> The band, it's like I'm working on it. Just. <laughs> so these groups are groups that are um, that were created and, and they exist within themselves, right? Even though now they are collaborating in these cooperative and, and coalitions, um, different from Sunrise. So Sunrise is actually a national organization with several different chapters. That's how Grace and I connected was through the chapter that I go to, which is Long Beach, and the people from Long Beach could not. Uh, like skip work to, to be here. Uh, we asked, and Grace actually was studying for exams, almost to come. <laughs> we had Nick bring her here to kind of make it work because I really wanted to someone that could talk about Sunrise as this national organization with all these different chapters, which facilitates the organizing that Kale was, was explaining. So, like, I can't, I'm sorry, I can't pronounce your name. I'm going to practice. Kale, that. that was right. Yeah. Kale, I said it right. So Kale was talking about how do you start, right? So it's very intimidating. I can only imagine what it's like in the very beginning. Like, what do we do? Sit in this cafe and like look at each other. Like, how do we start? But oh, some some organizations have a blueprint, right? Would you tell us a little bit about what it's like to be in a chapter? You know, when how do you meet? How do you know when where to go and what to do? This kind of stuff. Yeah. So. Um, there is a national sunrise movement, although I kind of have a little beef with them because <laughs> I, I feel like they don't like. So the way it works is like they come up with campaigns and stuff, and then they send it out to like hubs, and then we kind of work on them like mm -hmm. locally. But for me, I think or just my hub LA, we're trying to like steer away from that because like we need to be in the community, we need to be talking to people, we need to start by the people that are close to us and the people at national coming up with these campaigns they're totally disconnected from communities and, op and often they're not organizers themselves so it's kind of like how are you telling people to organize and stuff like that when you haven't even done it in your own community can you define organizing because that's kind of like might not be the best thing so what does that mean when you say or yeah. organizing what does that mean so i kind of differentiate from activism to organizing because activism I see it as like okay protest you know you're advocating for things but organizing you're really going into communities and like knowing people one-on-one -on -one, listening to what they need instead of going in and be like well I think you need less oil like oil wells and it's like, <laughs> obviously we do need less oil wells but it's like these communities they are living through it they live there instead of like us coming from like our own little um, cities, you know, we organize together and then we go back home into like sometimes some people don't live in like impacted areas. And so, yeah, like these just going in there and like really intentionally listening to people, hearing their concerns, how can we help and not co op like their struggle? Because there are people in those communities that are already doing the work, nice. they just need maybe a little bit more help, like with people. Um, or like funding sometimes and like we're able to do that so yeah just going into it and like don't assume you know what people need um just listen to them and like really make those connections because that's how do you how do that how do you go into communities so um you call somebody who do you yeah how do you start like well i think a good way is canvassing you just go into the community and you kind of ask them like okay like what's you know what like that somewhere huh like put a table somewhere no canvas is like door to door so you actually yeah so you're actually going to start the movement with your group and you're going to walk around and ask them direct like survey questions yeah um kind of like that or often um we don't go like us individually like just straight into the community we work with like community groups 
um, I feel like it's a lot better because they know the community better and they know like how to you know guide us and stuff like that. So yeah, just talking to people that are already doing the work there and saying like how can you know we help you? Is there anything that you need or stuff like that? And don't just like go in there and be like I'm gonna fix this all on my own. Like this is our struggle. Like no, people are there doing the work. Don't just go in there. So how do you network with people who are already doing the work there? Like you just Google it, like, oh, I want to go help this um, city. Sometimes. Oh, okay. Sometimes <laughs> you, you, you can do that, but... Um, you, usually, you usually meet them at, like, protests. Like, they'll randomly just be like, hey, can I work with you? Yeah, um, and then we do get a lot of, um, just because our members are so, like, into their, op like, different groups and stuff and we are part of like coalitions and stuff so that's how they find out and like we found out about communities right now we're looking um we're working with the watts community and that connection started literally two sunrisers were happened to like stumble into this um center and they were having a meeting and they talked to the people there so it's like you just kind of just throw yourself in there um sometimes you have to look for them but other times they'll like reach out to you I got like super excited when you asked that question because um, I'm kind of like a screw electoral politics but also because I hate it so much I'm like deeply invested in it and I want it to be better um, and so um, Sim right now is wearing a beanie representing Kenneth Mejia for LA City Controller I don't know if y'all have heard about that race um, but in Los Angeles um, Kenneth Mejia just got voted a city controller and he got the most votes out of any candidate ever in Los Angeles history. This is a 32-year-old accountant who like twerks on Instagram, has corgis, TikTok yeah, or TikToks, <laughs> my bad. Um, he's goofy, but incredibly intelligent and really good at what he does and he's community-based. Um, and something, or well also to add to, you know, how amazing his win was, he got, I think, the most Gen Z votes out of any other group. Wow. And um, a lot of people came out to vote because of his campaign. Um, and it wasn't just that he did things that he's like, oh, I think Gen Z people like TikTok, so I'm going to do that, right? Because a lot of old people go on TikTok and then no one wants to watch no that. Um, <laughs> um, but because he had youth leading. So it wasn't just like, we'll have you volunteer and door knock, which is important, and tabling and phone banking, all of those things are important, but like, we strategized. We were part of like the digital team. We were part of volunteer outreach. I'm gonna start working at his office soon, um, in two weeks. And so is a 19 year old like genius. Like he is going to be at City Hall um, with all of these like people who have been there for like 30, 40, 50 years who often don't treat young people like they have anything to bring to the table. But the truth of the matter is like we're the ones that are being affected by their decision. And a lot of times they don't even know what's going on, <laughs> especially when it comes to technology, especially when it comes to uh, climate justice. And so um, I'm rambling a lot, but to answer your question, I think like one thing is being involved with the campaigns and really like identifying people who will actually um, prioritize and understand the power that young people have. Um, and understand that just because someone is young does not mean that they don't get to be in decision-making roles um, and like don't have their ideas prioritized. So I think that's one really big thing. Um, but honestly, like that question is very difficult because I think a lot of us feel like we have been wronged and betrayed and lied to by politicians time and time again, right? Like there are so many people who are like, we're fighting for the climate and then take they, money from big oil. yeah, they take money from big oil, or um, they let bills pass that like allow more oil rigs to be created, um, and that happens so regularly. Um, and so, to be quite honest, I feel like the solution I have come to personally is just like we need to run for office. Like, 
us, the young people, the people that we actually believe in, the people that we can be energized about, like, not anymore um, of, like, these super old, like, uh, yeah. <laughs> I wasn't going to say it, but I was thinking it. Um, but people that, like, were, like, uh, they're the lesser of two evils, that's not going to work for us anymore. And that's not getting young people to vote. Um, so, yeah. Where do I find like a protest? Because like I'm ready to go. <laughs> <laughs> um, We're doing one right now, actually. Yeah. No, I'm joking. Protest is cool. Um, I think you know social media is a great tool for yes. that. There's something called uh, Action Network, which yes. helps you find protests in your your area. Um, and then also, you know, you sort of just gotta pay attention to like what's happening in the current events. They, like, you don't want to like, go, to, there's a lot of actions that are organized, unfortunately, by like a lot of people that A, co-op movements, or B, don't necessarily have the right intention. So mm -hmm. my best advice would be to stay clear of RevCom. <laughs> uh, and other than that, like, you know, just have an open mind and like, just keep yourself safe for like, social media. Do we have upcoming projects? We have, oh yeah, so there's gonna be a huge climate strike in March and of course in April because of birthday. But you know, if you care about other issues, you know, it's pretty easy to tap into. I don't know where you live, but like, where you live. He knows exactly where you live. <laughs> I, don't, I don't want your address before. But no, may I chime in? Yeah. Also, it's possible to organize something at the same time here, yeah. right? Like there's something to be said. Like these are people that are my network. That's why they're coming from LA because I'm new to this area too. Uh, but I, I, was think, I was thinking about when they were discussing the work that they've done with local, uh, helping elect the person that they trusted that was some, this is something that we could then learn and do everywhere. Every Space. little city that has a city council could, have, could use this kind of support, right? This kind of, um, this kind of um, um, work that is focused on a really creating the change that we're describing. It doesn't have to just happen in LA. It can happen everywhere, and we can learn from these. So I guess my answer is, what about starting a protest group here that is timed with other protests that are happening elsewhere? Do it, and do really it, networking do it, do it. Honestly, it's not that hard. It you just have to have like maybe four people with you to organize it, have like the schedule and pla like plan that out. Um, it's helped me in the past to like have everything in order, time out, um, think about the people that are going to show up if it's cold, you know. I think you missed the most important part, is that you have to have an issue to protest. Yes. Don't protest yes. anything. <laughs> <laughs> just, yeah, you protest anything. I just, yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 I mean, you can, strike, but... For the climate strike, all they do the it here. Yes. That's why. Yeah, 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 of course. On the same date, right? Like, so, like, yes. signing out when there's a, like, a lots of protests for that cause happening elsewhere and then organizing with enough people to go here. Is that what you mean? Yeah. Yes. But I think also like making it relevant to where you live, right? Mm -hmm. So like uh the like issues that are Grace? Okay, Grace was saying, right? So Sunrise has a very top-down hierarchical structure where they say, okay, this is what we're going to focus on, but like it's very broad sometimes for like the entire state. And so like, you know, California, and in particular where you live, has very specific issues, right? And so you don't want to have protests. This is very broad, and that was like one of the mistakes we made in the beginning of our organizing. We did these very top-down instructions. And we were just protesting. We're like, yeah, fuck Gavin Newsom. But then it was like, <laughs> no, not, all you, not all of them, but not a, all of them. A lot I of mean, them. November first. <laughs> November first was like a really. We had goals and strikes. Yeah, yeah. We but had like everything. Earlier strikes before that, there were very like you pulled uh, the um, for September. I like that. Like the demands were essentially yeah, around. Yeah, I know. <laughs> the demands came from the top November down. November was mine. September yeah, yeah, yeah. was not me. So November was better, September was not. So like the demands come from very top down. You want to make sure that they're relevant to where you live or they're not going to have the same impact. Like, you know, you can protest the government, the president all you want in Los Angeles, but like he just mm. doesn't care. But like you target city council, like you call them out by name, you know, you target your Martinez or like any of these people, like, you know, you call them out by name, it has a like, much greater impact. And I imagine there's not a lot of protests that like, going around here. So you find out the names of your city council members or like the president here, whoever, and you find out where they're taking money from, and you like call them out particularly. Like it's it'll be way more popular. Are you okay? No, I was like, I've got a, I've got a tangent. Well, a plus. Yeah. What you could do 
is organize a protest for the cafe that you have here. So I saw plastics and uh, my girl Val 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 Valeria, where are you? With, with your at, at your plastic case for the fries. Um, like, <laughs> honestly, what all of you could do right now is get one more person and say we will not purchase a thing from the cafeteria. Yeah, point no point. more fries. Point point point. We will miss like the suckiest class. Like we will all choose one class to miss until until like our, our voices are heard for sustainable plates and forks, spoons, knives, bowls, cups. Sorry, not sustainable. We're like, we're, uh, uh, when black and brown go green, we're trying to get away from the word sustainable. We're not trying mm. to sustain something mm. that is already mm. um, toxic, that's already unhealthy. We're trying to regenerate or generate a new paradigm. Yes? How would you go about that in a way that they wouldn't be like, okay, we'll give you your sustainable products, but then we're going to charge you actually back all the um, okay. Can I? That's oh, oh yeah. Oh, go. <laughs> Sorry, I grabbed. <laughs> um, so, are y'all scientists? Is that the situation here? Okay, cool. So, when we're talking, and I, I'm, <laughs> um, I'm political science, so I'm like a fake science, but <laughs> valid, I'm a valid Ooh. science. Um, but uh, I wanted to touch on you know, talking about protesting and activism and all of these things, a lot of times the core of the work we do and how we figure out like, what are our goals, what are the issue areas, is just research, mm -hmm. which is not always, depending on the person, is not always the most fun thing. Blamers. But if y'all like that, that's like such an important part because, so for YCSLA, what I do mostly is digital organizing. And um, a lot of it is just, creating graphics that are alarming to people. And so for our most recent strike, the first graphic I made was just, it wasn't just like, come to our strike. Like, we love the planet and we want to save it. It was like, um, city council has allowed over 100 million pounds of toxins, um, you know, like into our neighborhoods, into our lands, and it's, it's killing people. And that was like based on research and I had sources and all of that stuff. Um, I just want to bring it up because I think, you know, especially talking to all of you, I feel like that's probably something you're all really good at and that's something we need because it takes a lot of time to look up these things. And as someone who's not a scientist, like a lot of times I'm like, I don't understand this shit, I have to Google a bunch of things, yeah. Um, but um, to add to your question, that's a really important question, um, especially because I think a lot of times in the climate movement, we don't think about how things affect low-income folks. Mm -hmm. We don't think about how things affect black, brown, Pacific Islander folks. Um, and we're usually the ones that are most affected. And so um, <laughs> it really depends on like the person you're targeting or the power structure that you're targeting. For us, I think something that has worked for us is just like, sh <laughs> shaming people um, and being like, you hate poor people, you do this. We go to city council and we yell, but it gets things Disrupted. done. And we just, yeah, we disrupt, but for a purpose, right? It's not just to be loud, it's because if they keep doing things business as usual, it is harming people. Yes. And like, you make such a good point because a lot of times people will say like, or people in power will say, oh, I did this really good thing for environment, I'm the champion, but then at the same time, like, our bus fares go up mm -hmm. or like different things that make, you know, Why the climate know? movement has traditionally and historically been inaccessible to poor people. Mm -hmm. And again, we are the ones that are most affected. We're the ones that are getting cancer. We're the ones that can't afford asthma. treatment. We're the, yeah, I'm literally having like, I've been having asthma attacks like all day. So I'm like a, you know, visual reminder of that. But um, yeah, I don't know if I can give you like an exact, exact answer of like this will 100% work. Um, but I think doing research on who you're targeting and then making sure that everyone knows, like, this is a harm that they're causing. So knowing that just getting, just replacing plastics isn't enough. It has to be free. It has to be affordable. How do you deal with the pushback? Just real quick. Uh, how do you deal with the pushback? Because a lot of times when we're doing research on things, yeah. uh, like, as everyone... Met with, like, 
research is very powerful, yep. but I feel like getting the type of uh, information you need when it's not readily available is very difficult because you're getting a lot of pushback from those people that you need to get the info from. How do you deal with that? We shame them too. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, yeah, but I chime in. Yes. Because, so, uh, and perhaps not everyone is aware of this, but the group, the group here that you see with the largest number of students here are from principles of sustainability, a class that we are just concluding. Uh, and they all, they're working teams in different issues, right, that are, that they have identified as issues and chose to kind of do research. Mm. So one group worked with exactly the problem of the plastics in the cafeteria. Yeah. And so yeah. the idea here is that we are in an environment that hopefully we can actually get things done because you have, you know, the old people that we need to start pushing out of. <laughs> <laughs> not all of them, not all of them need to be put away, you know, completely. We can serve as a support for what you want to do. So the same way that we're working with communities and coming to communities to empower and figure out what they need to support for them to get what they want, we as professors, as people who want to support the cause are also telling you, we're here to support you. What do you think needs to be done and how, right? Instead of telling what needs to be done. So there is an opportunity here to bring that up to the administration, showing that most students are not okay with this, but we're also not okay with paying more of the price, <laughs> right? Yeah. And finding, showing them that there are many other alternatives that can be, and that's what these groups did, right? They looked at all the different possibilities, they calculated the cost, and they calculated the cost of something that was pretty remarkable, right? What was the one cost that you all got to calculate that was like, oh my gosh, especially the meat consumption group. The social cost? The social cost that a lot of times is not being talked about, it's not being discussed, but it's, you know, everybody's paying for the price of the pollution that some of these uh, practices are on, whether it's eating way more beef than what we actually need for health, or using plastic because we can't, what was the explanation that we got? That we can't put the reusable plates in a golf cart every day and take to the cafeteria where there is a washing machine, um, what is that, dishwasher. That was discussed, the research was done and the conversation happened. So what do we do now to, to take to the next step? This is a good, safe environment. And we have professors that can open the door, you know, and then do things and facilitate conversation. Can't promise that it's gonna get done, but student-driven um, action in places like campuses have way more power than a few old professors that are like, we need to do something about <laughs> <laughs> So I would also say the thing that, that has not worked a lot on our campus is many people give up. Mm -hmm. And so the institution understands that completely. And so when you guys say, we want no plastics, they go, okay. <laughs> and, and, and they'll wait three months. Mm -hmm. And then a lot of times, those students move on to something else, the summer comes, they disappear. And so I think also giving, even if you can't like solve it right now, but the notion of having a, a trajectory, that this is something we're gonna lock on to, and having a focus thing and having, you know, and, and, and keeping that pressure. And the thing that I, I, maybe you guys don't quite fully understand is that all the food services, that that, that stuff is, is under the people that deal with students, right? Mm -hmm. If we're talking about changing the, 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 main, the main power line, that's a different group on campus and they're a bit more resistant, but the food services, mm -hmm. oh my God, those folks are really, they love to say they're student-centered, student-centered. And if you have the students saying, this practice isn't student-centered, mm -hmm. and, and it was sustained, um, I think there's a very high likelihood of getting um, change. Mm -hmm. We're here to help, but we need the students to yeah, I have a question regarding because uh, we right now you get, as you guys were talking about the, like the single plastics in the cafeteria and stuff, cafes. Because we have like uh, multiple things, say how you know, like the smaller cafe down there, but we also have the cafeteria which also use single uh, mm -hmm. use plastics. How do we boycott that? Because uh, I don't know about the rest of people here, but there's people who live in housing and that's really like way to get food. Mm -hmm. Like that, I go there and eat three times a day. So if I were to boycott that. But I just have to go somewhere else that also probably has single use plastic and just pay over there, even or should I just use my meal plan instead of cafeteria? Yeah, 
Yeah. No. <laughs> don't do that. Don't do that. Uh, so accessibility has always been a huge issue, and it's a driving factor of like we constantly point the finger at low-income people, black and brown people. We're like, you know, you're not doing enough. But like at the end of the day, people don't have the capacity to do that. And so my first advice wouldn't be necessarily boycott the administration, right? It'd be do what I did, right? So I wrote the letter first, and I was like, hey, this isn't right. This isn't like how we do things, and we don't support this. And low-key petitions are really strong too, like like uh, professor was saying, um, I forgot his name, um, he was saying um, that uh, the food service is very student-centered and that they're very responsive to that. So you don't necessarily have to stage a protest or boycott it at first. And I'd be very careful about doing that, especially looking at the demographics of this university. I probably wouldn't do that, especially if you're like, you know, discouraging people from going into their only food source. Uh, I would encourage, you know, you write a letter and you attach a petition to it and you, you push it that way. There, there are processes and, and ways to go about things that don't always require direct action. So we have tactics of escalation in organizing, right? And, 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 and organizing, like, you know, we start here and then we go here and here and here. So I didn't initially disrupt Karen Bass and yell at her just to do it for fun. Like, I, I, there was a process to it. So I, I, I emailed her first and I was waiting for a response. I was like, she's not gonna answer me. And so, you know, I escalated. And so escalation is, is something to keep in mind when you're, when you're organizing and, you know, if you're really about it, you, you get it, you, you learn more, but like, you know, escalation, and there are steps to escalation, so don't just like hit full throttle. And you all know your school and like the environment that you're in better than we do. So like knowing the people that are on your side, the people in power that are on your side um, is a really important part of strategizing yeah. too. Um, and like Sim was saying, like, you know, boycotting might not always be the answer to things, but maybe at some point it is, or maybe it is for specific people, but not everyone. But if, like, there are a bunch of other different strategies, so. But um, also, sorry, I was gonna say, but like, if it gets to the point where you need to boycott, then set up mutual aid so that yeah. people can get food and then everyone can boycott it. Like, you can do things outside of the administration, but it really comes down to organizing, like, within yourselves and being you know, strong collective. Yeah. Yes? Well, I was just gonna say, this school is really good about listening to their um, I was a part of a group that pushed for changing the uh, recycling and garbage uh, waste on campus. And um, there is a sustainability team on campus, and you can reach out to them. They're very good at listening to the students. So it doesn't have to go immediately to like, let's all up in arms and protest. Like that. So, I mean, it's our fun. school is amazing <laughs> with sustainability and trying to do better every single year. So if you bring up your concerns to them about, hey, uh, we don't like the packaging that you're handing out this food in, um, they will work with you. They will, and, and a big thing too is bring them suggestions, bring them ideas. You know, they're not gonna do your work for you. So don't just say, hey, we don't like this. Say, hey, we did some research and we looked into the cost of uh, using this alternate packaging this alternate packaging. And it only costs, you know, five cents more per container, or this only costs this. And, and do a little bit of legwork for them yes. and bring that to them, and they can work with that. And they'll be more than happy to, to do something, you know, so it's, I, I love that. And yep. we're, we're getting to the top of the hour, and I wanna make sure that everybody gets their um, questions answered. I wanna, to make a point here that the cool thing about being in this environment, and I tell you this from the perspective of someone who was an activist on campus as an undergraduate student, although in Brazil, that's where I'm from, I was an activist in Brazil as an undergraduate, then in my master's I became an activist in that environment. The cool thing is that in those environments, you can get better at what you're doing, you can learn all these different ways of strategizing, escalation, organizing, whatever fits the need. And then you can take that outside, because at the end of the day, we're all very privileged to even be here, right? Mm -hmm. So once you learn those skills here, in what is somewhat a rel relatively safe environment, obviously sometimes that's happening in college too, but in general, <laughs> and then you can take it outside, which is what we're seeing happen here, right? And you can actually go back to the community that you want to work with and utilize that, uh, that those um, negotiation skills that you develop, that kind of research that you develop by creating, that, doing the lab work, doing the research, whether it's to convince other people to join the movement or to actually get stuff done. Thanks. So, any other questions? Oh, 
long. She had her hand up for a long time. Oh, sorry, I can see from here. Um, so actually for a professor's class, um, what profession do you do in projects? And kind of piggybacking on what you said and also what you said as well, I was in this group. So we actually got to interview people that farm the cafeteria. And I think because of the field that we're in, a lot of the time we tend to be very pessimistic. I'm sure you can talk about this in this class. It was uh, 0.14%. Yeah, it was actually mm. Okay, is there a, like a theater program here? Yes. Okay, lit. So, um, <coughs> like, how are you with like your, your, your comedy chops and like you and your classmates? Wait, like my classmates in the class? Yeah, for the acting classes. Okay, bet. So, what what y'all could do is maybe like a peak hour and a peak day of the week inside the cab. Get you and a couple other players, put up flyers, have it nice and planned. Have just y'all some funny MFs. Just go and have some really nice skits that make it that, like that make the content extremely digestible. But but I'm talking about like get get S and well no because S and L isn't really in your face these days <laughs> about about their, their protesting messages. Um, I don't know. I'm I'm a super fan of dear white people. You know, like they 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 really touch on some heavy topics. Um, and then Black AF as well. So I put it in, inside of a sketch comedy script. You know, and have maybe eight or nine. Um, players come do a nice hour show for a lunch, and 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 like at the top speak on, like make it very very light so like the audience doesn't entirely know that they're getting schooled, um, and then at the end, like have have people um, do a, a reward based <coughs> like kind of audience participation maybe, um, somebody gets a water bottle. Like like a reusable water bottle. Uh, somebody gets a, a reusable fork or something. Like like nice and pretty with stickers or something. We love stickers, right? <laughs> we love so I do. Right. <laughs> so like have have your classmates and your peers answer some of the things that like your actor classmates had touched on, and maybe invite some of the faculty and staff that's been pushing back against you. Um. And, and, and put it in their face as well. And then, like, revisit <coughs> the admin discussion of this is what we want, this is what the school needs to have a, a sustainable future or regenerative future. Yeah. I think Scarlett had her hand up. Yeah. Hi. Um, so, I pessimism and like it was really touched on already there's a lot of um, doom and gloom yeah, to what Kale yeah, said yeah. in this like topic of environmental science which is like my major so I'm like really passionate about climate change obviously and I used to kind of think like that too like I would want like it, you have a lot of emotion yeah. and shaming is a really effective way to make someone else feel very upset 
Yes. But like that is all it does. It really doesn't get you further than that. It depends on who you shame though. So like <laughs> if you're sh no, okay, go ahead, baby. I mean, just can't get <laughs> I feel like I should think that way too. Yeah. At one point, but like I felt that it would be better if I instead of like instead of and I think Bree and I, I'm sorry I don't know you but you made some great comments too like about the cafeteria stuff like instead of so you have a problem with the with the plastic in the cafeteria. I love that. And I love your idea about the comedy thing too. Like positive ways to like connect with people about this topic I think is the best way to do it because there's too much like doom and gloom and pessimism and it's really depressing and like if you just make someone depressed about it they're like they might not want to it, it really turns them off of it I, I think it could either that's true it could inspire someone but it could like just as easily kind of like turn someone away you know, I, I don't need this. Like, I don't want to even think about the planet dying. I'm just gonna do what I want. And but but if you kind of have, you have to make them understand that like this is sort of a problem that impacts you and me. Right. And when you shame them, it's kind of like you're you're separating. You're, you're separating yourself from them. We have but like you're trying to actually connect with that person. Is what you're trying to do. We have to yes. Can and I there share is. really quickly? Yeah. This like got me super fired up. So something that you all just talked about, we're all different people. So we bring different strengths to this movement and we're not all gonna do things the same way. And from my experience, like not one way of doing things is how things get passed in legislation or how change happens. It's because a bunch of different groups and a bunch of different movements are playing to their strengths and doing it. And a lot of times we don't agree. Um, but the fact of the matter is, like, we push different buttons. We change things in different ways. Like, so I, if I you, love how, sorry, I don't mean to pick up, but like, uh, you were talking about like escalation. Yeah. Like that's a great tactic. It, I mean, if someone's not listening to you, you need to make them listen to you. Escalation, is, escalation, is different from shaming. I would say. So okay. some. This is a technique that was specifically referred to as. What but maybe I don't know enough. Yeah, I think this is a technique that is specifically used for this specific people who name them politicians. Yes. So this is yes. something that is done in very specific situations by people who are willing to do, who have already experienced by learning from somebody else. I've done a part, I've done quite <laughs> a lot of that. And it's very effective, but you don't do it, you would not do it to the people that have to share No, 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 no. Right. Right. not the consumers, yeah. Right. yeah. But I would like to mention that we, we are all here we should all be very aware that recently we had the passing of a, I know I sound like a broken record, all my students are gonna laugh at me. We had the recent passing of a huge, huge law called the Inflation Reduction Act. Mm -hmm. And it was a huge win that was really based on a lot of shaming that happened on two politicians, two so Democrats <laughs> that were blocking the passage of a promise that was made by the current president to the youth groups. Yeah. That's how he got elected, and then that only happened <coughs> because shaming techniques that were used very targeted and very well done right. on these two politicians who then could not save face unless they actually came out and did what they were supposed to do. Yeah. So it's not about, you know, users of plastic mm -hmm. or like meat yeah. mats, right? That makes, that makes a lot of sense. Oh, I, I, Wait, I'm, so, I I'm so sorry. I know we're like almost done. <laughs> but I, yeah, I'm like so excited. Um, but also just to add to that, like, um, yeah, we are very careful about who we use that technique to. Yes, and so we use that technique specifically to people of power. And I'm, when I'm talking about people of power, I'm talking, earlier he mentioned going through MacArthur Park, right? And they said, we don't have enough money to like take care of the park. The city of LA gets over $11 billion per year and more than half of it goes to LAPD. And like a very, very yeah. small percentage goes to parks. Um, so they do have money for it. And so that's why we shame them because we try, like, we try to do it through legislation. We try to do it through public comment. And those are our first like go-to things, right? And sometimes we'll do like silent protest or try to not be disruptive. Um, but a lot of times that doesn't work. And so that's why we um, escalate up to shaming. But you do make a good point. Like you have to be very careful of the people that you affect. and. Uh, folks have said it a lot like how are we affecting low-income folks? How are we affecting people of color? And but one more thing I want to add Black brown Pacific Islanders frontliners. They're allowed to be angry and like we don't get to um, Filter them or decide if their anger is valid or not because yeah. they are dying. Yeah. They are yes. dying because of the climate crisis Yes, I just want to add really quickly too because 
you're you're right. Like we've been going around the doom and doom, doom and gloom, shame. But like that came from the fossil fuel industry. So the carbon footprint, which I sort of stopped talking about and stopped encouraging people to look into, came from BP. So British Petroleum invented the carbon footprint to pass the blame onto the consumer. Mm -hmm. And I, that I've heard that idea yes, before. Yes, it is. Crazy. Exxon Mobil knew about the climate crisis 30 years before any of us were born. So when this sort of idea comes to blame the consumer, that's from the fossil fuel industry, and that's not a tactic that I engage in or I support. Like I, it, I've gone off my professors sometimes talking about carbon footprint. I was like, don't do that. But like, that's that's how we have to we have to sometimes educate ourselves because you know this this information isn't really <coughs> readily available. And that is something we steer clear of, of, the doom and gloom of blaming the consumer. And she kind of is right, you know, people are allowed to be angry. When George Floyd protests happened, people were rioting and burning things in the street. And a lot of these people were black and brown. Like, you don't get to tell them, don't be angry, don't resort to that tactic, because yeah. that's how they express their frustration. And so, you know, there are, there are processes and there are ways, and we are trying to be more strategic and things like that. But like, hey, everyone's really mm -hmm. hitting a lot of good points. Oh, Grace. Yeah, I just want to say that like escalation and also shaming doesn't have to, I think it has like a aggressive connotation, like mm -hmm. violence, but it doesn't have to be like that. Um, for example, uh, last year, um, our youth hub, Sunrise LA Youth, put on a protest and they slept outside of Diane Feinstein's I'm office in, El, in Santa Monica. And they were there for like three nights and she found out that we were coming. And um, so like, and then she, um, one of our demands was there for her to sign on to the CCC, which is the Civilian Climate Corps, which got a bit watered down with um, mm -hmm. the infrastructure bill um, last year. But um, yeah, she found out they were coming, and then the next morning <coughs> she announced that like she was signing on to the bill. So escalation and like shaming doesn't have to be violent or aggressive. It just has to be like direct and just know that the. Because like these it's people, gotta go to the right place. I mm -hmm. know that, yeah, how yeah important and that also is. these yeah. politicians, you know, we have to kind of we do have to yell at them. Yes. They're the <laughs> ones making, on them. yeah, yeah. they're the ones making the decisions, mm -hmm. and often they don't even listen to their constituents. Mm -hmm. They just go into like corporate interests and stuff. So there is, we do kind of have to be a little bit aggressive disruptive. with them. Yeah. yeah, disruptive because that's the only way they're gonna listen. All right, uh, one last thing, probably the last thing you'll hear from me. <laughs> Something that <laughs> we've learned a lot. Uh, yeah, just a lot of numbers from uh, the class with over there with my professor about uh, certain dates like the 2030 and 2050. So I'm curious how you guys view that and how much hope you guys have. Because we've been learning that, like, you have to cut emissions by 50% by 2030 and, like, net zero by 2050. Yeah. And that sounds like a long time, but that's such a short time. And even though there has been uh, progress made, especially with the new bill, she was talking about, but it's still just such a short time that it makes such a big difference. I'm curious how you guys do that. I think for me, I don't really get climate anxiety just because I've been living in a community that has like polluting factories for like my whole life. So when people talk about climate anxiety, it's not something that, you know, really resonates with me or also like um, the bills that are passing, like I'm thinking, what is that going to do to my community? What is that going to do for my community? And a lot of the times, it doesn't really trickle down far enough mm. to the ones that are really impacted. It just goes to like corporate interests and yeah, yeah stuff like that. I think too, uh, so I'm actually organizing right around this issue too, is like, I do have climate anxiety because I understand things are gonna get a lot worse than they are. And I do live in an impacted, uh, frontline impacted community in South LA. So there's different experiences on like how we experience things. But like, you know, she's right. Like when it doesn't trickle down and Ira, in addition to the, the green infrastructure investments they're mandating equal uh like output from the oil industry so they're mandating extraction of oil and gas alongside clean energy and that's we know like clean energy has been like straight like tied down for so long like they were doing this in the 80s and Jim, jimmy jimmy carter started it and the fossil fuel industry killed it and so you know to mandate oil extraction alongside that does not give me a lot of hope and so i understand like the fight is is really intense and it's going to be very painful and you know I'm not particularly excited but like at the end of the day we have to do it regardless because things are going to get a lot worse than they already are so I don't have a lot of faith in like what exactly is happening but I am organizing about how we get that money into our communities with IRA and things like that. Thank you for um, mentioning that. I, 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 we are almost out of time. I'm going to let you speak but okay. I want to, before people have to go for the classes, we are going to have a similar series. Yes, I am for 
496. Six, four, 496. 496. Uh, and the idea is exactly to In the spring. In the spring. In the spring, yes. Okay. Every Thursday. And then the goal is to exactly talk about what Grace mentioned. This money was approved. It was a watered down version of a beautiful bill that was put together mm -hmm. by you, which was the Green New Deal. That got watered down, that got broken down, that got destroyed, almost didn't pass at all. Now it passed. So now our job. Our job now is to make sure that that money comes where it needs to go instead of ending up in somebody's CCS. weird account, right? <laughs> that's the new step. That's the new step. And that seminar is going to be exactly about that. It's like, what do we, how do we function as watchdogs, but also how do we create those networks within those communities so that when the money starts trickling down, and a lot of this money comes with this footnote that it has to be coordinated. The use of this money has to be coordinated with climate uh, justice and who are those climate justice experts? These, these, that's you, that's you all, that's this, the young people. It's not the old farts that are now like outdated. The old farts that are here to help, they want to empower you all, okay? So, how do we do that? How? We have very little time. But you all going to be hitting the, the job market right around the time that this money is going to start trickling down. That's exactly the word. It's going to be sent by the feds to those state agencies. And the state agencies are going to have this money. But what do we do with that? We don't know. We don't have any climate justice people here. They're going to go to the communities, and they're going to find who are the people that have these structures in place. So that's what this seminar is about. Sign up for it. We only have nine people registered for it right now. And it might not go if we don't have enough people. So register if you can. And we will be tackling this issue. How do we function both as watchdogs and as facilitators and I want to mention, as scientists, we have so much mic time, right? Because we come from this field of science, we're able sometimes to open the door for the folks that come with the political science background that we need because we don't have that point. But sometimes, just because we can say, I'm a climate scientist, the journalists are going to listen to us. The politicians are going to listen to us. And a lot of times, all we need to do is make room. Here comes the other people that you need to hear to as well, that you need to listen to. Does that make sense? So having this kind of network approach in which you have the artists, the political scientists, the activists, the organized, and the scientists, I feel, I feel in my experience, that that has always been the approach that works the best. Um, with that, I know it's uh, Wait, can I, There's like one yes. more question. She's yes. I saw her earlier. <laughs> um, okay, so my name is Sarah. I am the president of a environmental club on campus, Audubon. Um, president for two years and before that was an officer and every semester I have about two to three other people helping me mm. and I'm going to graduate this spring and I don't have anyone who cares to pass the torch down to I. and the person before me who passed the torch down to me she was huge on this campus huge she was going to start the club it was the first like largest chapter in California um, and now I have all this pressure to make sure that the club doesn't die. And I'm attached to a national organization too. And it's like, it's just, there's no one that cares like me. And I don't know what to do. Like, how do I work with two or three other people who are also going to leave? How do I find someone that's going to care like me? What's the mission? Um, so we are a uh, student conservation chapter of the National Audubon Society. Okay. So we care about the um, habitat that birds need to survive. So we do a lot of volunteer work with local organizations, um, like rebuilding fencing habitats and doing community outreach, which I love, it's adorable, um, with the kids and stuff like that. So and we do beach cleanups and things like that. That's amazing. Um, who in here, just by a show of hand, if, if, you're, if you're in Joanna's class, just raise your hand. Hand high, hand high, as high as Possible. <laughs> okay. Um, I'm seeing some brown people. So, if <laughs> if, if one of you, if not all of you, like I, I don't know, can maybe just share uh, a, a timeshare of a passion about about the club. Um, then I'm, I'm happy to step in as when black and brown go green as we go through our phase one um, as, as, as a fiscally sponsored support system. Um, 
if, if that's something that you want to explore, then, then let's explore it. And let's be very serious about it. But we were brought here to collaborate. And, and Simon Penny is, is, a, is an amazing mind that believes in me. Um, so I, I, it's, it's high time to like, believe in, in, in you all. Because I'm a, I'm a stranger to Simon still. We haven't met in person. <laughs> but we've already talked. <coughs> anyway, um, the idea the idea is that we have meetings like this, right? Mm -hmm. And so hopefully we'll have more meetings in that class that we're gonna have that's gonna come up too. And then sometimes that might be necessary. You remind me, burnout. You asked about burnout, <coughs> right? It might be the case that in some in some cases we might need to create systems for people to get paid to actually be able to have that. Within the, in the, that is something that the students realize that that's what they need. Right? Yes. Then yes. come to the old farts. Yes. Come to the old farts and let's, let us think together, right, to find solutions. I think the first step was this. I think I want to, I really, I'm so happy you all showed up. I'm so happy that you're all here. I'm so happy that, you know, I got invited to even be in this space, <coughs> right, um, because I was brought in in a way that I wasn't expecting and I was given all this space. Look at me, like, 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 And thank you for doing so much, right? Thank you for doing so much. I think we all need to thank you. You all heard her. Do you want to be a president of a club? <laughs> <laughs> That's it. But I really need to close because I need to talk to my students before we actually close for the year. So any other burning questions that can be answered quickly? Yes. Oh, gosh. We'll to <laughs> Stephen has a question. This was for uh, Shekinah. Shekinah. Um, anyway. going to look different for everyone and it also depends on like the type of person that you want to be in politics as well but I can share quickly about like my journey to where I am at now um, so I like hadn't even I don't even think I heard the word organizer or organizing when I was call in college so y'all are like way ahead of where I was at this point um, I just knew that I like that my family and so many communities around me kept getting fucked over by corporations and I didn't want that to happen anymore. So I was like, I will do something about it. I don't know what though. Um, so I was gonna get a law degree um, and did political science and then when I graduated, I just like was applying and when you're in political science, it's very difficult to find a job. Um, and so I started with an internship and it brought me, basically like I started off working for a congressional office and working for city government, I wanted to die when I was there. It was soul sucking. Like these people, or a lot of the people there are very fake. Um, a lot of them are mostly concerned like with their own image and reputation. And a lot of times they will do services in order to make them look better, not actually because they care about the people they are supposed to serve. Um, and that was draining for me. And like when y'all talk about being burnt out, like <laughs> I was just like, oh, past me. I was so burnt out. Um, and uh, so that's where I was. But then I joined um, a community organization. And that's what energized me. And that's also what made me learn like, this is how you make change. It's not by declaring change and pushing it on people, it's by being with people and asking them what change they want to see. Um, and so I've worked as a community organizer for three years, like in the traditional sense. And um, that has also been like, I have definitely been burned out there too because I work like 80 hours a week because it's a 24 seven job. Um, but also I get paid 19 bucks an hour, right? Um, so it's definitely like, sometimes I see tech startup people making 100K off the bat or lawyers making 200K off the bat. I'm like, damn, I want that money, but I don't want to do what it takes to get that money. Um, and that's my personal choice, not that anyone else has to make that decision. Um, but anyway, 
so was a community organizer and that's actually how I got involved with the campaign so I just reached out started volunteering like I wasn't planning on getting like super involved I was like I'm gonna fold some letters and hang out because um, there's like this really progressive candidate and I'm excited about them um, and then the candidate Kenneth Mejia was like hey what do you do for a job or he was like you're Filipino what do you do for work um, and I was like oh I work at this Filipino organization and he was like I want to do an event for the Filipino community because he's Filipino um, let's do it that's how I got involved and then I started you know, doing volunteer outreach with him, and um, and then he hired me. And so, you know, I don't expect that everyone or anyone else's trajectory will look exactly but like so that. Like making those important connections yes. with the community and but with yes, else yeah. I mean, community at the core always, right? But also recognizing, like, I think a lot of times, whether it's through media or whether it's like through panels with like politicians. <laughs> They'll give you like a clear cut way of going into politics, which is like get a law degree and then do this or whatever. Um, you don't have to do that. Do what you love and see how you can support community using what you love. And that's important. Like having scientists in government is so important because we have, again, people making $11 billion decisions that don't know the fuck about the decisions they're making. Like they don't know about how. Um, oil, like increased oil rigs are affecting communities. They're not listening to the people that are affected and they're also not the people affected because they live in like Beverly Hills and Hollywood Hills while well, the people they're supposed to serve are dying. So um, anyway, the shortened version is be part of community if that's the type of leader you want to be. Um, and if that's not the type of leader you want to be, then uh, I won't give you any advice on how to do well in politics. Yeah. Nick has his hand up. I have one quick note about getting into politics. Um, me and Grace are both like social science majors and nothing to do with the environment, honestly. And But we actually both work in a lab studying climate change at Irish campus at UCSB with scientists. And we actually both work for the FDA um, through this, it's through an internship program it's called the Virtual Student Federal Service Program. It's through the, all the multiple big federal agencies it's an eighth month program online, it's fully online, and it opens in July every year. And anyone, if you're in college, you can apply to it. It has every every single agency, state department, forest service, and you can do work. You can get involved to many other things that people don't know about. Like that virtual student program, I did not know about. It's not, not even people even apply to it. And what is it called again? Let me write it down. The Virtual Student Federal Service Program. It's FS, Virtual Student. Uh, what? Virtual Student Federal Service. Federal Service. It opens in July. Like right now, it's it's an eight month period, so it starts in September, goes until whatever finishes. But you know, like we're doing work for the FDA. We're helping like in, uh, what are we doing? Promoting <laughs> 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 diversity and inclusion in the FDA yeah. through employees, nice. through a lot of toolkits and other things. So it's really broad work, but. I'm saying, if you want to get involved, you can. Also, I don't know if this school has like a, a program where they send you to Sacramento or DC, but the UCs have a program called UC yeah. DC that yeah. I was involved in. Yeah, we have this. And I, I interned there for a quarter, and that can get you involved with really big agencies there. And also, I mean, even local counties. I'm I have an interview for a public service internship for Ventura County, because and I just learned. I just found out it like a day before it was due, and I applied. And it's like, and I'm interviewed tomorrow. Like I don't know if I'm gonna get it, but like there's all these sustain. Like, there's like a couple programs like sustainability program assistant. They're paid too. It's like seventeen dollars an hour. Like if you, you need to just like if you want to look out and find these resources, you can and apply and get involved. And that's that's what I'm saying. I I did not tell you that. Very helpful. Thank you. And there are policy opportunities. That we have a there's a o, um, Ocean Protection Council intern some internship that I saw that was announced mm -hmm. in our community. That's a good one to get involved. Because then you learn the skills, and then you have a chance to figure out if that's really what you want to do. Because you're all really young, right? So there's this, also this process of figuring out like where you fit best, where are your skills that you can bring to, that you can bring to the cause. If you already feel in you that that is something that you want to try, go, win it, try. Um, but also keep yourself, your mind open to the possibilities that you might be uh, picking up all the interests along the way and all the skills. I want to thank our panelists for being here. Thank you so much.
so I'm recruiting, like, pain, not painstakingly, that's, that's the wrong word. <laughs> <laughs> passionately, uh, rigorously recruiting uh, to fill out a few spots on uh, my youth advisory side of the board. Um, we essentially meet twice a week. Um, once is with um, our, our friends like Simon Penny. Hopefully we can get Joanna on board, hopefully. Um, and then with our fiscal agent on uh, Tuesday mornings. Um, and, and that is our like strategy meeting where we're programming um, exactly how we're gonna spend um, 91,000 for a Green Force program. On Zoom. Or virtually, or do people have to come physically to you? Virtually, virtually. Yeah, yeah virtually. 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 So, do you to find, to find out more information, do we, uh, what, what, who do we email? Um, or do we go here? Instagram is great. Yeah, email. I don't know, I'm, I'm, I'm 27. I, I get tired of emails <laughs> sometimes. <laughs> I, no. How do we connect with, with uh, you to find out, to get the Zoom link? Honestly, the best way is 323. Okay, two, what? No, three, two, three. Three, two, three. three. Can, we, can we go feel this love, please? I, eu sou brasileira, falo uma outra língua completamente diferente. Por favor, very slowly, please. Yes. Three, three, two, two, three, three, four, five, zero, six, one, two, two, nine. Six, one, two, nine. Second best slow. Okay, so phone number right here. Yes. Take the, so you can come. You can all come and take pictures of this. Thank you so much again. Um, <laughs> I didn't think you finished what you're saying. You said you're looking for people to go to your meeting. Oh, and um, <laughs> it it. <laughs> So, so these are programming meetings. These are these are strategy meetings from now throughout the end of the first quarter of 2023, um, and and longer if you'd like to stay on, because then I'll be having finance meetings to figure out like compensation packages. Um, we're deciding on how this fellowship would work for ages 14 to 26. 14 to 18 high school students are being led by 18 to 26 um, um, uh, college. Green Forest counselors. So we're planting 2,000 trees, gardens, yeah. giving gardens by 2024. These plants take three years of, of maintenance. So uh, essentially, these students that we're paying for short term and then we're building a scholarship fund for them as they work, um, we're deciding exactly on, on the mechanics of how that program would work. We see it in the nutshell. I've done a good amount of missing class and being late on homework assignments um, to, to write down exactly what this program um, looks like in the grand scheme. Now it's just putting gears in the right place and building it out. It's called Green Force? It, yeah. It, the, the organization is called When Black and Brown Go Green. The fellowship was called Green Force. Joanna called it a fellowship today. I, I was calling it an internship program. I like fellowship because it gives a sense of mentoring, right? Of the group's mentoring. But it, um, you can call it, you, I think you're so hip that you can call it anything you want and it will, it will be successful. I like fellowship. A question about the meetings and uh, the positions and everything. Yes. Uh, if we were uh, not directly to join, would it be possible to just join the meeting and just see how it goes, kind of just like in a, Absolutely. In a server? Absolutely. So um, a, a model that we have for our intergenerational advisory team is it is absolutely impossible to have a solution-oriented conversation without involving the people that you are creating the solutions for. It, it's, we don't need another savior. We need someone who, who, who can listen. So open to everyone. Yes. You can come and see how it goes, and then if it's something that seems feasible and workable, they can stay if not participate in it. Completely. We're, we're open book. All right. Thank you so much. Uh, give me my class today. Thank you.